that there are certainly lessons that can be learned. Mm -hmm. And if anything, you know, if we learn um, the harsh lessons that we've learned from the last 10 years that we've been at war, um, that force is not how you win wars today, mm -hmm. that creating partnerships, um, building alliances, even with people who you might not want to build alliances with, mm -hmm. that that is how you create the peace. And I think if we learn those lessons and we don't repeat the mistakes we've made in the last 10 years, then there will be, have been some value. How, how quickly after college or when, when did the idea germinate that you were going to want to enlist? I think it, uh, I, the, the short answer is I don't know. It's something I always wanted to do at a young age. I think in terms of watching movie, movies, watching movies, reading books, um, I think there is something interesting about um, probably men in particular, but you know, it could be war movies, it could be a movie like Wall Street, but there's something that even these awful situations and uh, there's, there's something that um, you know, is a draw of sorts. And so I, um, I just knew growing up I wanted to serve my country, I wanted to be in the military. I don't know where that comes from, I don't know, you know, it's similar to why does somebody want to become a writer, a doctor, mm -hmm. um, you know, why does anybody choose any passion? I think it's just innate. So at Cornell, uh, I played lightweight football, which okay. is a varsity sport for folks that are <laughs> the not. The Ivy League. <laughs> <laughs> for <laughs> smaller football players. Mm -hmm. uh, and my football coach is a wonderful guy named Coach Terry Collin. He's still coaching up there, and he's a highly decorated Marine veteran from Vietnam. Okay. Uh, Silver Star recipient, Purple Heart, and he had a huge influence on me at Cornell. Was mm -hmm. a real mentor, um, a good friend, and... I think he sort of pushed me towards the Marine Corps as opposed to the other branches. Mm -hmm. And so I actually went to officer candidate school while I was at Cornell over wow. the summer. Graduated August 11th, 2001, uh, or was commissioned August 11th, 2001. Mm -hmm. And then a month later, we were at war. Wow. So um, when were you deployed to Iraq for the first time? So my first deployment was in 2003. Okay. Uh, we went ashore in southern Iraq, mm -hmm. had a pretty uneventful deployment. Okay. And, uh, and then my second deployment was in 2004 in Al Anbar province, and that was a very different deployment. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the most dangerous part of Iraq at the time. Uh, we, I fought in the second battle of Fallujah, which is one of the biggest battles the U.S. has been in in the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. You know, the military is a phenomenal organization. Mm -hmm. It's filled with the best and brightest of a generation. Uh, most of the people I work with on a day-to-day -day basis are, are military veterans. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and I miss that aspect of it. I miss the people. You founded the Headstrong Project, mm -hmm. which is the purpose to heal the hidden wounds of war. Yep. And I'm wondering if part of this was inspired by your own story. I know you've shared um, in other interviews that uh, you witnessed an innocent civilian uh, mm -hmm. be killed, and I know that that must have been incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that you had you know, many friends who've dealt with PTSD, even if it wasn't your own personal story. Um, I hope you don't mind me asking no, about this. Um, and the statistics um, which you've shared on the Headstrong Project's mm -hmm. website are staggering. So 300,000 vets um, from both Iraq and Afghanistan mm -hmm. suffer P PTSD. Uh, there's an estimated 22 suicides a day among vets. And even of active duty soldiers, there are 30 to 50 suicides per month. Um, I found that statistic actually really interesting because as someone who has never been part of the military, um, I typically assume that people who are in active duty mm -hmm. are dying because they're dying on the battlefield and not because of the stress that they're enduring. Yeah. So the statistics are very real. Um, I don't think we know the root causes of, of most of those statistics. Mm -hmm. Very few of them are combat veterans. Uh, most of the 22 veterans a day are over the age of 50. Hmm. Um, so there's a lot of work that needs to get done. There's a lot of research that needs to get done to understanding the problem. Mm -hmm. um, I also think in terms of post-traumatic stress, um, few people really understand it. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand it. And uh, there's this perception of a veteran who has been traumatized by war, traumatized by awful experiences, who comes home is unable to feel or is angry, acts out, and um, is unable to turn off 
the flight or fight mm -hmm. instinct. And that's sort of the stereotype that we imagine. And that's in our collective consciousness. I think that's true in some cases, mm -hmm. but it's really not um, the norm. Mm -hmm. The norm is people like myself who, um, you know, are good people, um, who are put in awful circumstances, mm -hmm. uh, who um, have to deal with uh, issues of morality upon coming home. And I think if you look at folks in the military today, it's the best and the brightest of a generation. Mm -hmm. um, these are people who, if you, if you look at the statistics, 77% of 18 to 24 year olds can't even join today's military. Veterans are better educated, they have lower unemployment, they have higher rates of business ownership success. It's a phenomenal talent pool. Mm. Um, but these are people who also hold themselves to an incredibly high standard. Mm -hmm. They're people who are not familiar with failure. And that's the, one of the things that will happen in war is you're gonna fail. You know, you're gonna be put in situations where a buddy is gonna get killed, an innocent civilian is gonna get killed, and if you're not familiar with failure, if you hold yourself to a high standard, of course you are going to have emotional effects from that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that speaks to the caliber of these people. Um, and I think it's a very different way of looking at it than seeing a veteran as a victim, as opposed to a veteran as somebody who has their own agency, mm -hmm. who's feeling deeply because they are caring people who love their friends, who love what they're doing for their country, um, who care deeply for the civilians who they have been trying to protect or serve in these combat zones. And, uh, and that's a very different story. My job with the Headstrong Project is to make sure there's no barriers to treatment. Mm -hmm. There's no bureaucracy, there's no cost. So that's a fundraising issue. The bureaucracy is very simple. That's mm -hmm. just a standard we set. We don't even require proof of military service. Um, and making sure we have the relationships with outside organizations like Student Veterans of America, mm -hmm. Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, who can refer people to the program. So do you think the Headstrong Project um, has succeeded because it is founded by veterans and it's sort of like got I think this it's been successful because culture? we have a phenomenal team of clinicians mm -hmm. who are real experts up at Cornell. Okay. And I think there's an idea that, you know, a vet is the only person who can help a fellow vet. Um, if I went and had to get heart surgery, I would not know that my heart surgeon is the best heart surgeon, not necessarily that they served mm -hmm. in the military. Sure. Um, same thing for treatment for post-traumatic stress. So your latest initiative is Higher Purpose. Mm -hmm. So how would, in a word or a few words, would you describe the mission of Higher Purpose? This is not going to be in a few words, I'm sorry. <laughs> but Less than 1% of our country has served since 9-11. There's a huge civil military divide in, that, in our country, and that manifests itself with two fundamental problems when veterans are looking for work. First off, transitioning service members, their spouses, veterans in the job market, they don't know anything about the job market. Mm -hmm. They make poor career choices about what to study, where to live, what careers to pursue. They don't know a lot about the different companies and opportunities that are, that are out there. On the other side, you have a population of employers who very few of them have military experience. One in 150 managers today has served in the military, one in 600 HR reps. Yeah. And so there's a real need for them to understand this population, mm -hmm. to know how to evaluate them, to know how to find them, to recruit them, to make them interested in their companies, because this is the top talent pool in America, right? There's, you know, I went to one of the top schools in the country and I will tell you, the people I served with in the military are head and shoulders above my fellow Cornellians. <laughs> and I hate to say that, and I might get a letter from Cornell about that, but um, it's truly an impressive group um, that just needs help in discovering what their next purpose or what their next move is going to be. And so we built an online uh, career guidance system where we uh, help veterans figure out what they want to do, what they'd be good at, what their strengths are, what mm -hmm. their interests are, and then we match them to companies that want to hire them. And we work with those companies to develop military recruiting programs, to onboard military talent, to learn the benefits and how to hire military. And so we are a platform for leading companies to hire great military talent.
I'd say that the advice I would give to New Yorkers who are interested in this space is to participate, right? Don't write a check. You know, find a way to get actively involved with veterans. Go to a resume writing workshop. Um, you know, volunteer with the Mission Continues and go out and do something with them or with an organization like Team Rubicon. Um, find a way to participate, get to know some of these young men and women who are coming home because they truly are the best and the brightest. Zach Eskel, what is your New York state of mind? <laughs> so I think uh, my New York state of mind is a high energy, creative, um, purpose driven, um, but at the same time, you can be in this city that never sleeps, but then you can escape up north and just have quiet and have solitude and have peace and have sort of sweet, lucid air and the stars. And so I think New York gives you everything.